still here. All right. <laughs> this is amazing. Thanks for coming out, guys. This is going to be amazing. And I'm going to bring up your first comedian. We're, with no further ado, you've seen this guy. He's a nationally syndicated radio host. He's going to be headlining clubs in Florida. He's all over the place. He's hilarious. He's wild. He's crazy. Give it up for him. Ed Till, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Come on. Come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more time for Matt Nagin and this crazy show I fucking love. Watch the language. I don't like gratuitous, but it does punctuate once in a while. So I think that one was okay. Am I getting an approval on that first F bomb? If I keep if I keep it to a little literary necessity, we're good. That's the way I do it. Okay. Because sometimes the thing about the F bomb, and I don't think I need to say it over and over to make this point, it is a grunting, hard consonant uh, expression, and consonants really do the job, don't they? I gotta go to work. I'm not going back over there, right? Yeah, so that's what I like about uh, it. The, it's that CK part. It's not really the FU. The FU is what makes it sexy, but with, right? That's the part that makes it sexy and dangerous, but it's the CK that makes it hit. Boom! Little masculine, huh? Little uh, testosterone with the, the hitting and the landing and the consonants right out of the box. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, uh, well, you know, if I, if I just introduce myself to you guys through things the public has heard me say, then maybe that'll give you some insight into what this can all be about. Like, what are you? Your radio show is like this, talking about consonants and how the F-bomb is really an effective communication tool? Yeah, kind of was. So, if you tuned into the radio show in 1987, who was alive? Who was alive in the room? 1987, a young Master Edward Till here, youngest talk show guy in the building. So my job, one o'clock every day, a provocative topic to be delivered like this. Something you really care about, Ed. That's what you're supposed to talk about. Do I look equipped for the job? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think you see the right psychological state of mind to come out of the box every day and go, wow, you won't believe I was that guy. I love being that guy. So when I came on and I said, today's topic will be fellatio manslaughter. <laughs> In Atlanta, in the 1980s, do you think anyone had ever said fellatio at all, but fellatio manslaughter is how I got it in there. <laughs> Newsroom, life and death. If it bleeds, what? It bleeds. <laughs> <laughs> so I got me a story at my favorite place. I'm the youngest guy in the building. Everybody in talk radio is 50, 60. I'm 29 years old, and I'm loving life that I get this show every day. Talk about something wild and crazy, but something real. Get something from the newsroom. I tear the wire copy off, yellow UPI wire copy. <laughs> Comes out. Manslaughter charges are being brought against a man who was having an affair and was having oral sex in the woods. <laughs> a lot of other places. I don't know about the woods. A lot of bugs, right? A lot of trees, a lot of limbs. But having an affair on the lunch hour in the woods of Georgia but the, but the woods were on an incline. I know. Yeah. She's, she's a little worried. She's like, you know, how far is he going with this thing now? Do I have a shawl or something I can put on? <laughs> You're going to be safe on this. Um, having an affair is not easy to do on your lunch hour. So they would zip into the woods. They happen to be on a hill. 
She's downtown checking out the high, the tall building, if you will, working on the World Trade Center down there. The car's emergency brake snaps down the hill. But down the hill, where are they? In the woods, woods. So how hard do you hit a tree when you're a 3,000 pound vehicle and this poor woman is in the middle of fellatio? She's, she's fellating at the moment of impact. <laughs> he, he is knocked, not unconscious, but he's woozy. She's gasping, she's punching him in the thighs but he can't do anything. And she asphyxiates on the penis. Am <laughs> I getting calls on it? When I get in the studio, so my boss is like, so what are you talking about today? I go, uh, you're gonna love this topic. It's fellatio manslaughter. Goes, what are you talking about? The guy on the hill? What? I said, she's dead. He's up for manslaughter because he should have known you can't have fellatio on a hill. It's gravity. It's gravity. What are you doing? You're testing that emergency brake. It's an emergency brake. It's not a fellatio brake. That's what I meant. And you know, that whole uh, scene of, 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 of saying things like this in public. So immediately I was suspended from uh, my job. <laughs> and the next day goes, you're not going on today. I go, what are you talking about? Everybody's calling in about fellatio manslaughter. Everybody's talking. He goes, we don't do that kind of radio. We don't do fellatio manslaughter. <laughs> Boom. So I uh, took my punishment. I was off for a day, and the, some guy filled in for me. They always get the news guy. Uh, Ed Tell, as you know, has been suspended for his use of foul language on the radio station. Today, I will, I will bring this show back to sanity. You can call me about the city council budget, which is huge. <laughs> <laughs> but we want fellatio manslaughter. What happened yesterday with Ed Show and fellatio manslaughter? What's the update? So I got a week of uh, publicity out of fellatio manslaughter, and to this day, still thinking about making it the title of my radio book. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. It's a good title. It's a guy about here in an airport, and you're looking at all these self help. Chicken, and your chicken soup for the soul went bankrupt the other day. What the? How do you fuck that up? Oh, boy, that's two now. Watch your language. Uh, how do you screw up chicken soup for the soul? Aren't there enough books and videos? They went bankrupt. What kind of, what kind of CEO Caligula parties are these guys having in Thailand? Where do you spend all that money? How are you not rich? Chicken, do you know what chicken soup for the soul is? Do you know? I used to read those books. Oh, are they, <laughs> and you don't anymore, do you? When was the last time you bought one? I was a kid. Bing! And you know why you still are a kid, by the way. That was a nice saying, wasn't it? When I, when I went along that she was much older, yeah, it was wrong instinct. So, uh, yeah, chicken soup for the soul, man. If you can't sell that, if you can't tell people, all right, calm down, you know, Put on some soft music before you go to bed. Maybe take a bath in Epsom salts or something. Yeah. It's very harmless. People loved it, but uh, bankrupt nonetheless. So anyway, fellatio manslaughter is where we begin. Let, let me jump to the... <laughs> it is. It's the starting point. I think we know each other a little bit now, right? Get to know me. She's like, yeah. <laughs> it's not what... No, so, no, really, it'll be worth it. You watch. You watch. Just watch coming up. So he said, what kind of a guy would actually work diligently to put on a show about fellatio manslaughter? Who what kind of a, a person are we dealing with here? So yours truly, raised in Catholic school in the Bronx, you are looking at an obedient 
student. <laughs> didn't get jug. Didn't get detention. I was I was yelled at by a nun, but I was never slapped by the nuns. So my whole gig was: you don't get in trouble, you get grades, and you get out of the Bronx. You guys with me? You can't stay where I was raised on a main drag. Did anybody know that phrase? That's an old phrase. But I was raised on the main drag, the avenue. Big trucks coming by. It's a real world out there. Kids getting run over on their bicycle. So I got a bike for Christmas. I'm eight years old. This is the bike I wanted. I'm a kid from the Bronx getting a bike. Just having a bike is a big deal. Gonna ride your bike in the Bronx. Like, you don't care what's going on. Gunfire, stabbings, houses on fire, sirens. What do you care? You're riding a bike, you're a kid. I was going nuts. We were out there for a half an hour. Going nuts, going wild, riding a bike. And this is Santa Claus and my parents teamed up because it was a Schwinn Stingray. Oh, yeah. Santa Claus could not do this. The elves cannot build a brand name. Everybody knows that. My dad had to put special funding into the Christmas request. I was trying to verify that the bike was arriving all the way back to Thanksgiving. Am I getting that bike for Christmas? Do you think I'm getting that bike for Christmas? Get the bike for Christmas. But the Bronx, at Christmas, anybody know what the weather is like on Christmas Day in the Bronx? Cold, ice, snow, Santa Claus, weather. So now you're staring at a bicycle in a living room, and you're on it, imagining you're riding it, but you get a warm day. You're in the Christmas break. There's a warm day. You're taking this bike out, and now it's reckless abandon. Even the Schwinn people are not crazy about what you're doing with this bike. <laughs> Within 11 minutes, Bobby Rogers and myself were surrounded by a Puerto Rican gang. <laughs> and they were here to take my red Stingray bike from me and Bobby's blue ocean cruiser from him because it's warm Christmas bicycle day and near Jerome Avenue, we're sitting ducks. <laughs> what did our parents say to us? Stay on the block. I don't want to see you leaving the street. Stay on the block. And what did we do the moment we got in the street? Went off the block. Because why? Because the South Bronx has beautiful parks, man, with a path you can do like 90 miles an hour. It feels like it when you're a kid. So we're coming down the hill. We're at the bottom of the hill. We're surrounded now. And the skinny one, the shrimpiest one, decides to make a little stand for the bison. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot at pushing back on the gang. Because they're not like that, you know, they're not like from Venezuela gang. They're not M32. But they came two to a bicycle, these fuckers. Number number three. And uh, yeah, so they come two to a bike. So they get you surrounded, but it's three bikes, six guys. So I go, no. That's, that, was, that was my whole resistance movement. All I had was, no. And uh, the guy took out. Not even a switchblade, a pen knife. You know what a pen knife? You open an envelope with this thing, okay? But look at the size of me now as a full-grown adult. So I was down here, boom! I get stuck like a little, uh, what do you call it, like a voodoo doll. I get the stick pin right here on the rib. So now I'm like, you know something? You're giving up this bike. Because <laughs> he's got a weapon. But at least, you know, you did what you could. But I gave up the bike. The kid sped away on it. And now we got a long walk home. Santa Claus, your mother and father, are going to lose their mind that you had this bike out of the house for under an hour, and it's already gone. 
It's already down near Yankee Stadium, probably being auctioned off. So, uh, my friend's father is a police officer. He says, I think, wow, this is great. He's a cop. This is fantastic. We'll get the bikes back. I won't have to tell my parents anything. Great. So we go to Bobby Rogers' house, talk to Mr. Rogers, the, t t the detective. What does he say to us? Oh, don't worry about that. There are more bikes in the world. Let <laughs> what the fuck, Dick Tracy? I, I thought you were going to fix this shit. No. So now Bobby's having ice cream. Everything's okay in his fucking life. I have to go home to Santa Claus and, you know. So I walk in and I go, uh, something bad happened. Yeah. My mother right away, what? What? You know, right away, you know. And my dad, what? What, wow, something happened with your bike? Where's your bike? <laughs> <laughs> so I go, uh, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, uh, these kids robbed it. What? Where the fuck? Is it? He's screaming now. Where was I? My mother says, what are you holding? Because I got my hand over my little war wound over here. And she goes, what are you holding? I said, well, I kind of got stabbed. That was the best. Man. Italian mother, only male child, stabbed by a barbarian. It's the end of the Roman Empire in my mother's world right now. What's going on? So, all right, so my mom's all, Edward. My father's like looking at me seething with anger, like a dragon. You know those little dragons when they would look at something they were going to blow fire onto, but they were pissed off before they blew out the fire? Right. That's what he's, he's snarling with fire coming out. And I don't know, I'm thinking, what is he going to do to me? And what does he say? Get in the car. We're going to get your bike back from the <laughs> South Bronx. <laughs> Oh my god, this fucking lunatic now. What, he doesn't realize they have guns, they have chains, they have motorcycles, they'll fucking kill us, and no one will find us. It's the South Bronx. They don't, the news reporters don't go down there. Only the uh, medical examiner, you know. Uh, so, we drive around for an hour and a half, and every intersection, is that your bike? Is your bike over there? Is that your bike? Where's your bike? You see your bike? And sure enough, 90 minutes in, I see the bike. Oh my God. <laughs> see, this is the way it was. Oh my God, right. Because I have to now what? Am I going to let my dad murder a few people just because they stole my bike? Because that's what would happen, right, baby? Um, before I can stop stammering, that's your bike, all right, jumps out of the car grabs the bike away from a kid who was leaning on it. Kid wasn't sitting on it, but leaning on it. Rips the bike away, throws it on the back seat of our Plymouth Savoy. <laughs> Big ass back seat. And, uh, and then we take off. Now if it's me later in life, I'm gonna be zooming the hell out of there, man. Get the bike, let's go. Not my dad. Is a yellow light, he stops for the red light. <laughs> and we're sitting there for three and a half minutes, and I'm like, this is going to be the way Kennedy got it. Right, right from behind, I could feel it going through my neck. The first shot, then the, you know, the second one will hit my dad's thigh. That car, that Plymouth Savoy, a three-speed shifter on the column, baby. Anybody even know what that is? Yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> so anyway, that's who I am. I'm the, uh, <laughs> I'm the one who goes right into the bad neighborhood with the great bicycle and then has Batman as a father. <laughs> so we get to, I said, uh, 1982, good year to jump ahead to. And, uh, I'm in law school and decide I, I'm not going to be a lawyer. I can't do it. It's it's too much. You know, it's it's there academically. It's it, why not? But I can't bring myself to be what everybody else is becoming in the first year of law school. So I, I kind of start listening to this guy named Larry King. Anybody remember this guy? Yeah. Best interviewer in the world and. Uh, he used to come on at midnight, and I had classes. I had like 7.55 a.m. classes at the University of Miami Law School, and I lived off of campus. Yeah, to get in the car, drive the car, park the car, get in there. It's crazy. I would leave at 6 in the morning to be at a class. 
So I'd start listening to Larry King at midnight, and I would find myself awake when the sun was coming. So I'm like, this is what you need to do. But nobody, you're a kid, you're a student, you're not even a lawyer, you're nothing. Why would you get a show? I said, well, you know, because I don't know anybody else that has a show. I have a lot of shit to say, right? Young people have stuff to say. 24 years old, why, don't, why shouldn't I get a show? So I went back and forth in my head for like a week and I went to a radio station right up the street. I go, hey, I uh, listening to Larry King at night, he's great for my parents. But you guys have nothing going on for my, my people. You know, we're 20, 21, 22, what, we talk about stuff. So this guy gave me a show on a Saturday and uh, said, all right, let's see how you sound. So he puts me on nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and he says, you know what I'm gonna do with you? Open the phones. He's gonna let people call in, ask you who you are, we'll just see what happens organically. I go, fantastic. Go in there, Ed Till, good morning, Saturday morning, what's going on? Hey, Bob, uh, what do you have to say? Boom, hit the button. Oh, you're a fresh young voice. Uh, did you know about the great conspiracy to undermine the Federal Reserve? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I, uh, I know about the Federal Reserve. <laughs> All right, I know a little bit. It's on the dollar bill right there, Federal Reserve note. I say, it's right there. No, but you don't know who the Bilderbergers. <laughs> I said, the, who are the Bilderbergers? No, Europeans. These are uh, billionaire Europeans trying to take the American uh, way of life down. I said, well, how come I've never heard of well, You know why you haven't heard of them? Because they're rich and it's a big conspiracy. And you're playing into it because you're a young talk show host and you don't know any better. So I bet you're going to be a tool for whatever diabolical plan they're working on everybody. I'm looking at this, you know, I'm staring at the phone. It's Saturday morning in Palm Beach, Florida. No one's even awake yet. This guy's going off like a Roman candle. All of a sudden, I look out the window of the studio. My boss is pulling up like Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> Parks the car, jumps out of the car. He's running now. And what am I doing? I got a guy on the phone who says that, that Europe and a bunch of billionaires are trying to destroy the American way of life. And I'm helping them with my ignorance as a young talk show host, how could I not know this? He comes bounding into the studio, takes a manila folder, remember those? I don't know if you guys know what that is anymore. They're uh, a cardboard and they have notes of paper in them and he takes it and he slams it down and he goes, go to a break, go to a break. So I go, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you, Bob, about the end of Western civilization. <laughs> Thanks so, thank so much for your call. I, go, I have to go to a break. And he goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what do you mean, what's wrong with me? I said, you hear that guy in the money? He goes, that's what I'm talking about. You can't let him come on our station and scare everybody like the wife should be. Imagine, imagine if you turned on the radio. And they said, well, you know, Western civilization is going to end tomorrow around 5 o'clock. It's all over. Banking, water, air. It's all going under. It's all going away. And you were convinced that they, they were on to something. That would be a dark day, would it not? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's what, that's what I'm guilty of allowing to have happened in the town of Palm Beach. Anybody know about uh, Town of Palm Beach, uh, Flor Floridian people? Town of Palm Beach is wealthy elderly. You can't move in until you're 81. <laughs> Not even 80. You have to make it all the way to 81. And you have to have a net worth of like 11 something. Million, 100. You need 11 of something. But they let you in uh, under those requirements only. And um, I by allowing the Armageddon man to speak, had made the phone at his house, the, the owner of the radio station, monitored the switchboard at his house. So nine calls at a time were coming in. How are you letting this guy destroy Western civilization? How, how can things be coming apart now? And he's like, no, no, it's a radio show. And, and it's a kid. He doesn't know any better. He's letting the caller go on. So now the city council on Monday drafts a resolution 
Town of Palm Beach comes together, city council vote, to condemn the segment of my show. Not the whole show. So I was, we went to the meeting. I mean, the third part of that segment of the show is very funny. No, no, we like the third part. But we're condemning the Armageddon man. <laughs> So that was, that was my first distinction in broadcasting, was allowing a, a crazy person to speak on the air. Yeah. Lady, I worked hard to get in that much trouble, and uh, that was just the beginning. So fast forward a couple of years, and um, they call me a shock jock. We know this term? Oh, never, oh, you know what? Can we get more of you? Um, shock jock, you guys have heard this term? Yes. yes. Means what? Yes. Say anything yes. just to shock them. Yes. You know? yes. Uh, there's an old movie, oh boy, here you go. This is really going to help your, uh... <laughs> this is going to broaden your youth appeal when you say something like there's an old movie. But there is a fantastic movie. Oh my God, you bring some back for us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow, what is that ice or gelato? What do you got there? Wow, come on, man. Rainbow? You got rainbow, didn't you? Oh my god, you got rainbow. Is that rainbow ice? Is that Italian ice? And you're, and you're Jewish, but you know about the Italian ice, right? Italian ice, come on. Does it matter? Makes no uh, distinction. Wow, a rainbow ice, but I will tell you, it's 2024. Spoon, right? Spoon. Yeah. You guys remember getting ices when you were a kid? And it come in a cup, and you just squeeze it, and it would drip all over you, and you'd suck out the juice at the end. You didn't want it to end, but you also didn't want to go back and buy another one. Yeah. I used to get ours at Pat's Pastry. Right? It's the best, right? Your mouth lights up, just roll it all over your gums. Right, hitting all those taste buds. Oh, man. Killing me. Killing me. Well, this is what I mean. Now, you're talking about the wooden spoon. The wooden spoon. The wooden, now, the wooden, the wooden spoon was great. Oh, come on, the wooden spoon. That's how you get stabbed back at a guy when he's stealing your bicycle. Sharpen that bad boy. All right, so we're going to go there. Who knows the game Scully? S-K-U-L-L-Y. Scully. Give me a New Yorker in the room. Okay. So you don't know about shooting bottle caps with your middle finger? Oh my god, you guys missed it all. What were you, a video game? We you have some kind of a race car thing, or you're shooting people, oh, you got, the, got that Call of Duty, that's a good one. <laughs> Just murder people for three hours. Oh no, we had, we had a bottle cap, and that's all you needed to play the game. Take the bottle cap, and you take the edge, and you scrape the box right into the asphalt, middle of the street. Cars are coming left and right. You're playing in between cars. You scrape out a box. Then you take that bottle cap. Got to take that middle finger. And you got to shoot that boy along the perimeter of the box. And you get all four corners have been touched by the scully. Then you have to shoot the, uh, a bottle cap to the center of the box successfully. You win. What do you win? You keep the bottle cap. <laughs> scully. Shooting Scully. You guys want to shoot some Scully? It's great, man. Right away, the first thing you do is you walk the gutter. Is any, again, you got to be an urban kid. Do you know what the gutter is? There's a street, there's a sidewalk, then there's the gutter. Do you know what the gutter is where all the dirt and the crap piles up before it gets pushed? down the, in the gutter. We would go to the gutter and look for a virgin bottle cap. A bottle cap without that big dent in the middle because somebody used a bottle cap opener. We need a good flat bottle cap. Once we get it, we fill it with soft wax. Where do you get that? When you, you steal a kid's crayon. Some kid sitting over there coloring on the side of his house, he looks away, boom, you swipe a crayon. You go get your father's cigarette lighter, and you burn that crayon right into the bottle cap. Oh. <laughs> okay. Scully. Best. Uh, comes right after monkey bars. Remember monkey bars when you were a kid? 
Right? And, and what happened? What did they do to kids that you need a rubber mat on an outdoor monkey bars? What, is it because kids bruise more easily? Are the streets more dense? What did they do? Well, it's good when you fall off the monkey bars and you get a big scrape on your forehead, right? Go to school with that the next day. You're a tough guy. Love that. All right, so anyway, what kind of a guy would do fellatio manslaughter as a topic? Make his career <laughs> choice. Something that would get him fired from one job, goes to the next job, etc. Well, I'm the guy who, on the swimming bus, anybody ever go to swimming classes, go to a pool with your school? Saturday, all the little Catholic kids were allowed to use a public school bus. And we go down to the South Bronx again, <laughs> but we were under the guard of nuns. So if anybody made a move on us, the nuns had like M16s they could pull out from under their habit. Bronx nuns, very tough. So on the bus coming back, we had one lay teacher, and her name was Mrs. Bertolini. How, do you, how does that sound? It's a real name, Mrs. Bertolini. But let's say you're a kid. Does that sound like weenie? Let's say you're a kid. You're on a, you're on a swimming bus. Mrs. Bertolini, how does weenie sound? That's pretty funny, right? But I love to do a little shock jocking right on the swimming bus. So I go, whistle while you work. Hitler is a jerk. Mrs. Bertolini bit my weenie. Now it doesn't work. I didn't say that once. I said that several times, getting more joyful with each one, because I discovered Bertolini and Weenie, and said it first, Bertolini, Weenie, and I'm back, and Miss, uh, because Bertolini bit my, I, I say it, I didn't just say it. Dun, 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 dun. Hit it, whistle while you work, Hitler is a jerk, Bertolini bit my Weenie, now it doesn't work. Then I said, you can do better, better closing line. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Right? I'm singing this thing, singing my heart out. And my new closer is, Bertolini bit my weenie, now it doesn't squirt. Oh, what are you doing now? What are you, what, what's wrong with you? You've won too many. The M16, right? Comes right up with the rosary beads. <laughs> gonna spray you with lead and rosary beads wrapped around the barrel of the gun. So Robert Charles' sister never liked me. Roberta Charles. I kind of liked her. She was cute. She didn't like me. So I was a Weisenheimer. Yeah. Right? He's a show off. What do you think, huh? <laughs> Last half hour. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, no. Take your whole fucking life, type up a list of everything you fucking like, and you're gonna tell everybody about it like they give a shit about you. Wake the fuck up! Easy, easy, come on. <laughs> to make one voice in my head aloud at a time, who let you in? There's my Ozempic when I need it. Uh, yeah, so uh, she turns me in. Now it's Monday, and they say, uh, the Monsignor uh, would like to see you. Wow, the Monsignor, man. This means you're getting kicked out of Catholic school. Now you're going to get stabbed over at the local public school. And um, brought my dad in, brought my mom in, suspended me for a day again for a bad language. So I think I'm, uh, am I showing you guys a pattern? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, how about some social commentary, huh? Can you take a look at what's going on in the world? A little crazy out there. So, it's boring for me to bring up Trump and Biden. I mean, that's all I've heard. It's all, my whole profession was that a couple of years ago. Not interested in the two of them. And it, there's an old video. I wonder if you guys are going to know. Anybody know who Frankie Goes to Hollywood is? Yeah. Okay. 
There is a video from when I first got MTV called Two Tribes. Mm. And it's about Reagan and one of these Russian guys having a boxing match, but they're so old that when they hit, a piece of them falls off. <laughs> right, so they're deteriorating. And it's amazing, we're back there now. I mean, the politics is one thing, right? All these issues, but two really old people, it makes us look like Roman Empire Caligula time a little bit. I don't know what you guys see there. So that's why I say it's not so compelling because it is kind of tragic, but there's always comic relief. Robert Kennedy Jr. is running for president. Does that even ring a bell? That, like, does Robert Kennedy Jr. even mean anything to you guys? You're kind of young. The, uh, the original RFK, you would know who that is? Doesn't mean. Doesn't mean, you're right, exactly. <laughs> now, if I tell you that it's a famous family that everybody loved, you would know what I mean, but you wouldn't have been witnessed any of that. Right? Beautiful. How about you? you know, RFK, does that ring a bell at all? Wait, so it, just words, right? It's, it's, it's kind of wordy, right? It's not like real. Yeah. So who remembers who Sirhan Sirhan is? Yeah. 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 Boom! So this is what I'm talking about. First you had John Kennedy, tragedy. Then you had Robert Kennedy, tragedy. Then you had Teddy Kennedy, crazy Caligula, a little bit of a Caligula guy. So this new guy, this is pretty wild. Right? To have that name. And that his father was, you know, one of these legendary dudes. And um, he came on the scene kind of suddenly. And it reminded me, because we're in a conspiracy era, right? We people talk about conspiracies all the time. So RFK Jr. comes in and he's suddenly on the scene. And I go, this guy came in like a magic bullet. You remember the magic bullet? Then this way, then that way, then this way. And then somehow one bullet did all this stuff. It was an incredible bullet, like an Elon Musk bullet. An AI bullet, right? I'm gonna hit this guy in the shoulder, but I'm gonna pick off a piece of uh, her pinky. I'm gonna circle around, get this guy in the elbow, and this guy's not expecting it. Boom, finishes with him. Magic bullet. So I'm like, that's what RFK Jr. reminds me of because he's anti-vax. I don't know. <laughs> I got anti-vax people, right? Yeah. Anti-vax. Anti-vax. They go there. RFK people are in the room. Yeah. Watch it. All I can say is duck. The magic bullet is in the room. <laughs> duck. Uh, and... Uh, it's incredible to me. So he's anti-vax. Then he's um, he's anti-gravity. Yeah. I mean, you don't believe in gravity? Not all the time, he says. Not all the time. <laughs> so it's quite a campaign. So they. Oh, you know what? I, I this is not even in the notes, but I, wouldn't you love to see now? Uh, Biden had this terrible uh, debate, right? Oh my God, he's so old, he's feeble. So don't we need, just to spice it up a little bit, don't we want Michelle Obama to come in and just fucking kick the door open? Fuck you! A black fucking woman, you're electing my fucking ass, this guy is done! And Kamala would be like, uh, sure, whatever you say, Michelle. <laughs> Kamala Harris is going to put up any resistance if a Michelle Obama with a beautiful chest plate says, Michelle, waving a, a vote-counting weapon. Um, and then what, what, the debates with her, imagine Trump afraid of her on the stage. She's coming in. So let me tell you something. And he's like, what? 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 Oh, my God. We can dream, can't we? I, um... So, um, okay, Matt? Right back. Oh, good, there you go, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so I think I'll wrap it up with this. You guys have been so great. Um, this next story is absolutely true. 
and it has nothing to do with anything else that we've discussed, but strap in, because it's a little bit of a crazy real life episode. Doing stand up on McDougal Street, I used to do it five nights a week at the same bar. And the job was to stand in front of the bar and get passers by, come on in, we've got a great show. It's called Barking. And then wherever you bark, you kind of pay attention to, make sure they get their drinks. And you know, it's a customer service thing, get them in the audience. So I barked in a woman who is 6'4, ah, a buck 80, 200 pounds, big, big girl, and uh, happy as could be, but you know, was talking to me at the front door, and all my friends are teasing me. Hey, what's with the uh, big girl? Wow, huh? Wow, would you love to, you know, be, uh, like, you know, take it easy. She's a customer. But she had a very gregarious personality, and uh, <laughs> she uh, was very uh, much a laugher uh, at the show. So she's in the back of the room. I'm the host, again, the young guy, the new guy hosting the show, and she's laughing like crazy on my little bits. Wow. So now the show is over. People are filing out. And she's lingering. It's like, all right, we're going for a little goodbye now. Thank you. Glad you stayed. Appreciate all the laughs. That was fantastic. Yeah, I'm so glad you had a good time. She goes, all right, uh, enough of that. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I might need a permit to walk. You know, the disparity in size, anything can happen here. So we get out of here, and getting out of here was around the corner from McDougal Street. There's a place called Mineta Tavern, yeah. that Mineta Street. She lives right on Mineta, and within three minutes of leaving the club, we're at her second floor window in the dead winter, zero, two or three degrees outside. Windows open. She's got the Rolling Stones live album blasting, smoking pot like a chimney long before you knew it was legal. And she's singing like sympathy for the devil out the window. And I'm sitting on the couch going, you know, just wait your turn. <laughs> she's going she's to come to you because she brought you here. But you have no idea what she's doing right now. So sympathy for the devil's going. The reefer is going. She takes off her shirt and she starts calling to people on 6th Avenue. Hey, taxi! Taxi! And I, I'm watching the breastage go in and out of the heated area because it's you know it's warm in the apartment, but she's leaning out and just screaming at these guys. I'm like, wow, this is uh, doesn't normally happen <laughs> to somebody like me. <laughs> this is something I'll read in a magazine or you know some episode of a TV show, but not me. I'm not having this right now. So anyway, uh, this song ends, and now it's Wild Horses, which is a slow, laborious song. Wow, couldn't drag me away. So the lights get low. She disappears into the bedroom, and she rattles a pill bottle in the doorway. Rattle, rattle, rattle. She goes, you got to do one of these Percocets with me. They're fantastic. <laughs> And I'm like, what the fuck? Come on, do a Percocet with the woman. Be a sociable person. So do a Percocet. Sitting there, and I'm like, okay, I don't really know what a Percocet does, but I know it's happening right now. I can feel the uh, something moving. Something's going on. She says, we need to go into the bedroom. And I'm on Percocet. So I have no idea what can happen in there, but okay, we're in the bedroom now. She's on one side of the bed, I'm on the other. It's her bed. Got to let her go in first. Can't jump right in. <laughs> go find your spot. <laughs> Get the better pillow. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So she says, oh, I forgot something on the way in. Oh, and I'm thinking, you know, soda or something like that. She goes, um, I need you to run across the street and get us, get us two dildos. <laughs> True story. Hand to God. Exactly the way she says it. Now, again, I think I told you in the beginning of the show, 
I'm an obedient Catholic boy, do what I'm told. What do you think I said to those words? What do you think my reply was when she said, you have to get go across the street and get us two dildos? Yes, ma'am. What do you think? I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> Grab my wallet. I got the bank card. How much did these things cost? <laughs> I can buy two dildos. I know how to do this. <laughs> I can do this. So I walk in. If you know Sixth Avenue, um, there's the IFC Film uh, Theater. The place that I'm talking about, right next door, about 20 feet to the left of the theater, uh, one of those, um, uh, I guess a porn store, you would say. Porn, uh, videotapes, all that. But in the front, a wall of dildos. All Superman, Bart Simpson, uh, you know, every costume superhero is a dildo on this guy's wall. And I said, I'd like two dildos, please. <laughs> Just like that. Why? Because I, 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 I'm ordering on behalf of someone who knows the dildo world. I have no idea what was... But I'm on a mission. So I say to the guy, uh, he goes, oh, well, which dude do you want? I have uh, Batman, I have Robin. I said, well, look, just give me two different ones so I can tell them apart. Okay? We good with that? So far, you with me? So now, I bring these things back, and I rush into the bedroom where the lights are low, and I get down to the entering the bed. I'm not in the bed, but I'm entering the bed, and I hand over the dildos. I say, so, I'm curious, why did you want two of them? Good question, right, at this point to ask. Because now you're thinking mathematically, how many places are there for these things to go that you're totally okay with? She says, um, don't tell me a guy like you has never had a dildo in his ass before. Oh. <laughs> Do I strike anyone in this room <laughs> as dildo ass boy in any way? <laughs> Are you texting that out? Yes, I can't believe what this guy is talking about up there. He's got some dildo with a girl. Yeah, so... Um, now, I'm the guy that you've been listening to for the last half hour or so. So I start to think the following. If a dildo is going into a vagina, that is a well-lit discotheque. There's music going on in there. That's a happy place for that dildo. That vagina is all set. They got the DJ. You got to be careful. The floor can be a little wet. But aside from that, the dildo's going right in. Well, what happens to that other dildo? There's no lights. There's no neon signs. There's no youth gathering in the front and great music playing. It's just somewhere down an alley. And if you bump into anything along the way, you better duck. <laughs> so I think of all this as she is preparing me for my first experience. If I were assertive and, and not a, a good Catholic, uh, obedient altar boy, maybe I'd speak up and say, you know something? Maybe this is going too far here. But I didn't say that. Instead, I sent a message down to the port of entry. And I said, you guys have got to hold the fort. You cannot let this in no matter what. <laughs> now she's a buck 80, six four. This is a big girl. She's got some forearms on her. She starts to press that dildo. And my guys tighten up. And she pushes harder and she tries the angle. She tries to come in from three o'clock, nine o'clock. Nothing is happening. She puts two arms into it. That dildo bursts. And it's a room full of Duracell batteries. 
everywhere you look, copper tops. <laughs> but guess what village is still intact? Edward Till Ciudad. <laughs> the mayor is proudly at the border. No one entered illegally. <laughs> All right.